Believe in yourself, cause it starts with you And then everyone else will believe you too And if it looks like you're the only believer around Just keep on believing, don't put yourself down Just believe Our guest this week had a tough childhood Being abandoned by his alcoholic father at age five and orphaned by his mother's death from cancer when he was nine. He experienced a Christian conversion at age 15 while attending a camp run by Fellowship of Christian Athletes. In 1989, he joined Focus on the Family, and since 2005, he's been its president. His name, Jim Daly. And I'm Jack Russell, and this is Anything is Possible on 760 WJR. I'm Jack Rasula. This is Anything is Possible, and we're talking to the president of Focus on the Family, an amazing man, Jim Daly. Jim, welcome. An honor to have you. <laughs> Jack, I, I love that. An amazing man. we got to talk to my wife, Jean. <laughs> <laughs> she says that every morning to you. <laughs> <laughs> she reminds me, hey, you're not that amazing. <laughs> she actually keeps my feet on the ground, which is wonderful. Um, all right. You're the youngest of five children. You grew up in Southern California. Talk about the first nine years of your life, Jim. Sure. Yeah, that was difficult. Uh, you know, a normal dysfunctional family. My dad was an alcoholic. My mom actually was also an alcoholic until she found out she was pregnant with me. And uh, she decided to stop drinking. Thank you, Mom. And, uh, you know, I came into the family. I was way down. I was the oops baby. <laughs> which is always wonderful when your parents introduce you as the mistake. But uh, anyway, I was six years away from the cluck of uh, siblings I had right above me, so they were all one year apart. Then six years later, I was I was born. And, uh, yeah, my mom and dad ended up divorcing when I was five. My mom remarried when I was eight, and then she died of uh, cancer when I was nine, and I ended up in foster care. So it was turbulent. There was a lot going on. We weren't a Christian family. Uh, we didn't have regular traditions in that regard. And although my mom was very um, sensitive to spiritual and Christian things, we she was raised in a Catholic home, so we ate fish on Friday. We would always tease her, like, why are we eating fish on Friday? <laughs> She'd say, because it's what we need to do from the Bible. <laughs> so that was awesome. But it gave her, you know, it gave her an incredible foundation. And uh, the day before she died, our neighbors, the Hopes, believe it or not, that was their last name, the Hopes, went to my mom's bedside at Long Beach Memorial and asked her if she had a personal relationship with Jesus. And she said, I don't think so. And they led her in the sinner's prayer. She died a few hours later. Wow. Whether it's the first hour or the last hour, all it is is you got to get there. So, all right. Amen. By the time yeah. you were 18, you had lived in 24 houses. How did you get to become a Christian at age 15? Yeah, you know, I had a football coach. I actually, after my mom died, our stepdad left us the day of the funeral. I ended up in foster care for about a year. Then I moved in with my brother, who was probably 20, 21, and I was 12. Um, so he... Uh, uh, was married at the time, later divorced, but it was turbulent in that environment too. I, I uh, ended up playing football. I love sports. That's where I kind of found my confidence. Ended up being quarterback of the football team, that kind of thing. And and I uh, had a football coach when I was 15, Paul Mora, who has passed away. I was able to speak at his uh, funeral. And he just took me under his wing. He, he and his wife, Joyce, and they had me over for taco night and Eventually, they offered to pay my way to a Fellowship of Christian Athletes camp at Point Loma that he was also going to coach at. And so we all went down there, and we probably had four or five guys from our team that went down there, and it was all fun and playing football all day at Point Loma out in Southern California. And then uh, at night, they'd have a professional football player come in and talk. And I just remember uh, it was a player from the San Diego Chargers at the time, San Diego. And he, he said, you know, has your father let you down? Has your stepfather let you down? I thought, man, he's got my dossier. And then he said, you know, I'll introduce you to somebody who will never let you down, and that's Jesus. And I gave my life to the Lord that night. I wobbled. You know, I'm in a home that didn't have a lot of structure. So it took about seven years. At age 22, I really caught fire 
Um, but I was trying from 15 to 22, like in a normal way, to be a good teenager and do well in school and all those things. But that was kind of it. And then when I turned 18 and, and ended high school, started college, it was like a book slam shut. And that was an old chapter, an old book. And I was able to say, okay, Lord, let's write the future together and what will that look like? So, yeah. So I finished school, which was great, and uh, ended up finishing my MBA and went to work at International Paper and then eventually got to focus on the family. Jim, if there's a listener tonight that's had a bad, bad deck dealt to him or her, and they're listening to this, talk to them about how God can use one angel like Coach Mo in your life, to transform a person's life, just one angel. Definitely. And I think the key is your your eyes and your heart being open to that person's attempt to be helpful to you. You know, some people can get so racked with bitterness that even when a good person comes along, a Christian, to help, they they reject that help. So it's keeping your heart open. I love in Psalm thirty four eighteen, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those crushed in spirit. I remember a pastor once saying it's a prerequisite to have that in your life, to be crushed in spirit, so the Lord and the Holy Spirit can work in your life. I thought, wow, okay, isn't that amazing? And so on the one hand, it gives you an attitude of gratitude to go through that kind of furnace, that that threshing floor to be crushed and to be ready and humble, <laughs> to say, Lord, I need you. It ain't working with me in the driver's seat. So for that person, I would say that, you know, if if you're blessed to have someone come along and, and provide wisdom to you, man, take it. The Lord still gives you a choice. You can reject it or you can accept it. And it starts like with what you said, your ability, your willingness to yield your life to Christ and to become a son or daughter of his. I was recently interviewing Phil Robertson from Duck Dynasty, and he's so plain spoken. He said, think about it, Jim. Here's a man that comes along. He's raised from the dead, proving that he's the son of God. And then he says to you, I'll take all your sins. I'll give you eternal life. And he goes, who wouldn't take that deal? (laughs) And it's so true. So you have to set out and prove to the best of your ability that you believe Jesus is who he said he was. And that's really what I did at 22. I was sitting in college, you know, reading all these business books, and the thought struck me. I have got to read the entire Bible and understand it and decide up or down if I truly believe it. And I did. And I did. (laughs) And uh, changed my life. I'm Jack Rasula. This is Anything is Possible. When we come back, we'll ask Jim Daly how it was he joined Focus on the Family in 1989 on 760 WJR. Welcome back to Anything is Possible. I'm Jack Rasula, and we're with Jim Daly, President, Focus on the Family. All right, let's go to 1989. How was it you joined Focus on the Family? Yeah, that was kind of fun. I was at International Paper. A friend of mine had moved from Campus Crusade crew to Focus on the Family, and I had done a short four-month stint at crew. I was uh, finished my last year of college at Waseda University in Japan. So I came back to Southern California, and a friend of mine suggested I go get a job at Crew, and so I did, and I got hired as an hourly employee. And that's where I met Ron Wilson, and Ron then had moved to uh, focus on the family long after I had already left and, and went into industry. So he called me out of the blue and just said, hey, would you work in nonprofit again? I said, not really. <laughs> and I'll tell people the, the wonderful thing is uh, when you say to the Lord, not really or never, watch out, <laughs> because that's typically when he starts acting. And uh, sure enough, Ron called me back probably 10 months later and said, hey, we got a position. I think it'll fit you really well at Focus. Would you be willing? Ironically, that very same day, I got a, a promotional offer at, at International Paper. Hmm. And I ended up turning down $150,000 to earn 32000 at Focus. But my dear wife, Jean, she said, hey, I trust whatever you want to do. I asked her, man, what, what should we do? We only owned a dinette set at the time and slept on the floor as a newly married couple. And it was so refreshing for her just to say, hey, I believe God is leading and directing you, so I'll I'll stand with you no matter what you do. And that showed me a lot of her character, too. So it wasn't about the cash. It was more about the commitment. And the Lord honored that. Over time, I eventually ran the international division because I had international experience. 
And then, uh, you know, the Lord just kept blessing me with promotions here at Focus. In 2005, the Lord blessed you with the title President of Focus on the Family. <laughs> and very quickly you said, team, I want to focus on five strategic priorities for Focus on the Family. If we could go through them one by one. Evangelism. Yeah, we doing... yeah. go ahead. Sorry. Evangelism, the first. Yeah, so, you know, we had never really measured the impact of focus on the family, and I started, you know, again, this is more of my business background, but applying it to the ministry environment. So we started doing survey work with the people that were impacted by the ministry, the listenership, and those that supported the ministry, et cetera. And we found out that about 150 to 180,000 people a year were accepting Christ through focus on the family. So I said, man, we got to concentrate on that and, and see if we can continue to ask the Lord to bless that and get a little more organized with how we invite people into that relationship with him. So foundationally for us, that's the core of it all. As Dr. Dobson used to say, he'd say, you know, we can help a family, but if we don't introduce a person to the author of the family, we kind of miss the mark. So that's become our clarion call from our founder to remember that the call is to make sure people have a relationship with Jesus or an invitation to. Then we can begin to work on the issues in their marriage and their parenting. All right. The second strategic priority, speaking of marriage, please. Yeah, so marriage has always been a part of uh, focus on the family. It's a, a core to what we do. We believe that, I mean, culture is either strengthened or weakened, uh, depending upon the strength of its marriages. So that, that's why Dr. Dobson left the University of Southern California School of Medicine and started his Christian career as, uh, as a leader of focus on the family. And he just felt families needed more attention and that they were, you know, getting destroyed by the culture. Well, he was prophetic, wasn't he? And he knew what um, 30, 40, 50 years later would look like. And so he went to work. And so we picked up that same challenge. We have additional outreach now. We have something called Hope Restored, which is a marriage intensive four days of intensive 38-hour work in those four days, so you can imagine. And uh, 81% of the couples that come, even though half that come have already signed divorce papers, but 81% when we survey them two years later, are still married and doing better. It's probably the best thing going on in marriage reclamation in the country right now. So we have five sites that couples can go to, and I'm really proud of that work. And uh, I think it's demonstrably going to put a a reduction in the Christian divorce rate. And when we can do that, when we can save 40,000 marriages over the next five to seven years, and hopefully reduce the divorce rate in the Christian church from about 38% to maybe 20%. That'll be something to talk about. If you want to learn more, www.focusonthefamily.com. Focusonthefamily.com. Speaking of which, the third priority, parenting. This is probably the core to Focus's mission. It's what Dr. Dobson came out of. He earned his Ph.D. at USC in child development, was teaching doctors, particularly pediatricians, how to better relate to children. That was his passion. And when he started Focus, um, I would say our core competency was really helping parents do the best job they can at parenting. He wrote the great book, Dare to Discipline, kind of as an antithesis to Dr. Spock's book, and uh, and it took off. Millions were sold. I think it resonated with parents that boundaries for children are important. They learn so much about themselves, self-respect, etc. And uh, and so that has been our core competency, and we continue to, to work in that area. Now you can sign up uh, on a Focus on the Family app to receive age and stage content for your one-year-old all the way to your 18-year-old. Every year we identify the things that you might be dealing with that year of development with your child and what to help them with. So it's a, it's a great time to, to take technology and use it for good and for the Lord, and that's one of the ways we're doing it. So anybody that has a parenting need, this is the place to come and get some advice. www.focusonthefamily.com. I quote you, Jim. Life within the family is happiest when we focus more on God and others and less on ourselves. Mm, isn't that so true? I was talking to a psychologist just a few weeks ago, and they they were specialists in trauma, specifically like survivors of hurricane, school shootings, and those kind of catastrophic events. Interestingly enough, they found out the number one predictor of survivability and thriving 
is humility. And when he said that, I just went, wow, that was the number one predictor. He said, yeah, a human being can get through all those catastrophic events in their life if they have humility. And I said, why? What is humility? In that definition, he said, humility gives you the ability to look at the plight of others and compare yourself and say, I am in a better position than so many other people. And then externally to be able to have empathy for other people. And I went, isn't it amazing that the Lord says to us, be humble, because I, your God, is humble. And that humility is even showing itself now in science to be the attribute that helps a human being get through a crisis. I just find that amazing. And uh, to me, that's, again, showing that Scripture is true. We're talking to Jim Daly. When we come back, we're going to continue talking about the strategic priorities of Focus on the Family. And I'm Jack Rasool, and this is Anything is Possible on 760 WJR. This is Anything is Possible. I'm your host, Jack Rasula, and we're with Jim Daly, President, Focus on the Family. All right. Number four, advocacy for children. This is so much fun because this is our ultrasound machine placement in pregnancy centers across the country. We have helped to save now an estimated 510,000 children from abortion. And this is the great stat, a large number, about 60, a little over 60% of abortion-minded women, when they get an ultrasound of their baby and counseling, will choose life for their child. And again, this is why those that oppose life, uh, particularly in the abortion industry, try not to show that mother uh, an ultrasound because moms, when they see their baby, those arms and legs kicking and that even thumb sucking in the womb, it just, you you cannot argue that it's not a life. And uh, we've been at the forefront of that. We were the first ones in the country to launch ultrasound machines and pregnancy resource centers. So we're very proud of that 20-year work and the numbers that we've, obviously with the Lord's blessing, have been able to achieve. We're now expanding that to the pregnancy centers across the nation to try to help equip them to do the best job possible with uh, job training, job placement, to make it kind of a one-stop shop for women who are in trouble, who have an unplanned pregnancy and don't see a way out. So often those women struggle with financial decisions. They can't pay the rent. They can't take care of the bills. So we as the Christian community together coming alongside those community-based clinics who can really deliver the help need to step up. And so we're mounting that effort right now and and going after it in both blue states and red red states. And I would just say, Jack, the, the thing I'm excited for is the scripture proving itself true again. I think those states that support life, you're going to see a robust economy, robust family, you're going to see God's hand of blessing in those states. And uh, those that uh, lean toward death, I think you're going to see decline and decay, what God calls chaos. And I think it's beginning to happen. All right. Speaking of which, the fifth and last strategic priority, engaging the culture. Now, this is an interesting one. The metrics are a little less specific because this is just really what we're called to do in the public square and the way that we do it. And I think You know, so often when you look at the culture war, that's an unfortunate banner. And what I mean by that is Christians, I remember having lunch with David Horowitz, the former communist lefty who became uh, actually a a right uh, pro-education, choice education um, lobbyist. And and David's a great guy. He's a secular Jew, but he really believes many of the things that we believe in the conservative Christian community. But at lunch— he said, Jim, don't you know you're in an alley fight and the other side has switchblades? I said, David, I, I understand that. I get that. But, you know, the weapons of our warfare are love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, mercy. And I remember he pushed back from the table and said, wow, those aren't very good weapons, which is exactly what they told Jesus. <laughs> I mean, Lord, really? You want to fight with love and joy? Um, but that is the weapon of our warfare, the weapons of our warfare. And a person's heart typically is cracked open when they are vile and horrible toward the Christian community, yet we can respond with the love of God. They don't get that. They don't understand it. So we have to maintain 
the character of Christ as we battle the culture for those things which are true and righteous. But never forget that balance between truth and love. The divisiveness within America and the world is unbelievable. What should we do when we're with family members that we disagree with? Well, you know, so often this is true in marriage counseling. What you're trying to say is have an ear to listen. I mean, it's just what the Lord tells us to do as well. I mean, the Lord asked a lot of questions and gave very few answers, ironically. Um, but he asked questions in such a way that it led a person to recognize their own shortcomings and the need for God. And I think in those conversations with cultural opposition, we just need to kindly, lovingly, forcefully, ask the right questions. A great example is the transgender issue. Um, when you look at the data, Dr. Mark Yarhouse, who's somebody I lean on for that input, he's a Christian, he's on the, the APA, American Psychological Association panel on gender dysphoria. He sits on the panel that provides medical insight into these issues. And he said his metadata collection, meaning going around the world, collecting all the studies on transgender issues, gender dysphoria, 70 to 90% of teens and preteens will self-correct by 19 years old. So the message is leave them alone. And so one of the things that we promote here is that kind of clinically backed data to say it's immoral for the culture to take this on as a political uh, situation to mutilate these children to put them through that kind of hormone treatment for political ends. Europe is waking up to it, but here in the U.S. we're continuing to use minor children as a pawn in this big game of political power. And we're going to reap the whirlwind for it. You're seeing detransitioners now writing books saying, all I was looking for as a 13-year-old was acceptance. I didn't know I had to mutilate my body to get it. And now as a 23-year-old, I will forever and never be able to be a mother. And I've totally made poor decisions. Where were the adults in my life to help me from making that terrible decision? And unfortunately, in the culture, you have schools jumping at the chance to encourage children to make those horrific decisions at a young age. So that's just one example of how you got to get into the culture, advocate, but do it in a way knowing that even those people that have evil intent, that, yeah, God died for them. That's hard to fathom, but it's true. All right. Focus is very active in the pro-life arena. Y you mentioned Option Ultrasound. Can you talk more about Option Ultrasound and Alive from New York? <laughs> that was a great event. That was the first one that we did. Um, so the Ultrasound Project is really placing these machines that show a baby. These machines today are so powerful. Thank the Lord for GE, who came up with that technology to look into the womb and see that baby. You know, oftentimes, I mean, it's six weeks, they have a heartbeat, and they are well on their way to fully form in that first trimester. And so the ultrasound is a powerful image of the baby in a, inside a mother's womb. So we had the idea, we had the idea to go to New York, and I kind of came up with the tongue-in-cheek title of Alive from New York, which was a playoff of Saturday Night Live's Alive from New York, or Live from New York. And so we uh, we had about six months to pull it off. We didn't get our permits until the morning of the event. We, we weren't really welcomed in that city. The, that's a very pro-abortion city from the mayor all the way through the the governor. But anyway, we got the permits right at the last minute, and uh, we were able to put on a live ultrasound right there in Times Square. We had 20,000 focus supporters there. We probably had another 30,000 bystanders. We had four, 400 protesters. So it was a live environment in Times Square. But the tears when people actually saw, we played on the jumbotrons that we had to bring in because the ad agencies would not sell us time on the jumbotrons that exist in Times Square. So we brought our own jumbotrons, put them right there in Times Square, and played that imagery of that live ultrasound of Abby Johnson's baby. She was in a medical mobile unit right there next to the stage, and uh, people were in tears. And people stopped. It was an amazing moment in Times Square, like time stopped. People all stopped, believer and non-believer, looking at that baby. Tears were flowing. It, it was the moment. And what I felt the Lord say to me was just show them the baby. You know, it doesn't take a lot of words. Just show them the baby. And it was captivating. We're talking to Jim Daly, 
When we come back, we'll ask Jim about a recent initiative, Wait No More. And I'm Jack Rasula, and this is Anything is Possible on 760 WJR. Jack Rasula, host of WJR's Anything is Possible, the weekly radio visit, brings his 15 years of inspirational storytelling to hardcover. With God, anything is possible. of Jack's more than 750 tales of defeating odds and achieving the extraordinary. Like Bob Woodruff, whose job covering the war in Iraq nearly cost him his life. And Nick Vujicic, the limbless evangelist who has stunned millions with his message of acceptance and grace. With God, anything is possible. Order now while signed copies are still available at trustinusllc.square.site. That's trustinusllc.square.site. And as Jack says, Make it a great week because with God, anything is possible. Spohol. Anything is possible. I'm Jack Rasula. This is Anything is Possible. We're talking to Jim Daly. Jim, in 2008, you helped birth... Wait no more. Talk to us about this initiative. Yeah, it's really born out of my pain of foster care. And so we started a a foster care movement. I'd rather say it that way, where we were trying to get churches particularly, because the number that struck me, we have about 400,000 foster children in the system in a given year. About 100,000 of those parental rights have been terminated, and they're looking for homes for these kids. It's a very sad situation. Oftentimes, uh, these children show up at your home with a hefty bag of belongings. They have no suitcase. They're usually from uh, socio lower socioeconomic circumstances. So we decided to get in. And I talked to pastors here in Colorado, and they jumped in, and to their credit, really, highlighting the plight. We had about 850 kids in Colorado that were in the foster system that were needing adoption, and we were able to get about 600 of those kids adopted in about 18 months. Phenomenal. And I just, it gave me the impression that if we could do this in other states, it would, you know, be terrific. So we probably had about 7,000 to 8,000 children out of that 100,000, roughly, that are bubbling through the system with no parent, parental rights being terminated, um, adopted through the program. So I'm excited. I'd love to see the New York Times someday write a headline that says, Christian church wipes out waiting foster care adoption list. Wouldn't that change the identity of the Christian church in this country? I think it would. And so we worked to that end. And uh, there's no greater a field uh, of harvest than the foster care system. And we need good Christian families in there because these kids are hurting emotionally. It's not easy. And when I came home and told my wife about it, she said, well, we should do it if you're asking other people to do it. I said, well, I did it. I was a foster student or a foster child. And she looked at me like, right, that doesn't cut it. Let's get licensed and let's get kids in our our home so we know what we're asking other people to do. So we did. We did that for about 12 years. And we are super connected to many of those children still after many years. Tell us about Boundless.org, please. Ba- yeah, Boundless is a great little on on ramp to focus on the family. This is an outreach to 20, 30 singles who want to be married, just haven't found their mate yet. And so we encourage them to go deeper in the word. Uh, Boundless.org is a great location for these singles to go. And uh, we just encourage them to deepen their relationship with Christ and then to keep their eye out for who God might have for them. Uh, But it's full of great articles, great content for the single. And, you know, we don't want to make marriage an idol. Uh, We just believe most people will get married in their lifetime. It's good to be single. It's good to be married. But uh, for those singles, what should they do to prepare themselves for marriage? And how do they use their time as singles? So it kind of addresses those core themes. Chuck, the late, great Chuck Colson once said, what the world needs now more than ever is for the church to be the church. <laughs> what did he mean by that? Well, I think he meant... Uh, you know, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and loving your neighbor as yourself, and your neighbor is everybody, um, even those people that disagree with you. 
it's an incredibly difficult task to do that out of your own humanness, your own flesh. You have to have the indwelling Spirit of God in you to be able to love your neighbor. And uh, unfortunately, as you said a moment ago, there's increasing divisiveness in this culture. I think it's a tremendous opportunity for the church to be the church and to show a different way. And I think that will be the challenge for us, that uh, keep one foot in the political kind of cultural arena and one foot in Scripture and being a good Christian, being a good neighbor. Uh, We've got to manage those things well and not be co-opted by the power structures of this world. We have to be, after all, passport holders of heaven, not just the United States, and that's a much more important passport to be a member of. <laughs> so, you know, I think keeping those things straight and and fighting those battles out of the spirit rather than out of our flesh is critical. And I think that's going to be a big challenge in this generation and the next. If you want to learn more, www.focusonthefamily.com. For the last several years, you've had a daily radio broadcast with co-host John Fuller. What do you try? What do you try to achieve with that each day, Jim? You know, we look at those five core areas that we covered. Thank you. Uh, you know, evangelism, marriage, parenting, advocacy for children, and then engaging the culture. And we attribute the content of every day's broadcast, uh, either a portion of it to one of those five, or all of it to one of those five, like a marriage broadcast. And then what we're trying to do is, you know present something, we always would call it a meal, that people can can certainly eat at that table and encourage their marriage and help them to become a better parent and make those commitments faithfully. And I think if we can do that, if we can strengthen marriages and strengthen the parenting ability of parents to pass on their faith and you know, good, healthy skills to their children, living skills. Those are all great contributions. And, you know, for the donor community helping focus financially, uh, we do keep that survey work going. So we know how many parents have been helped, how many marriages have been helped uh, through the years. And it's in the hundreds of thousands every year. Marriages strengthened, for example, is like 540,000 last year alone. So we do that survey work every year, um, and it's profound the the number of lives impacted through the ministry and we give God the glory for that. I just you know, Dr. Dobson is the founder, did a fantastic job building an incredible um influential organization and we continue to use all of that to build on and to increase its influence in the culture. And I'm I'm really pleased to say that a dollar invested focus really goes a long way in helping so many people, literally hundreds of thousands of people every year. Jim, you've said a lot of things that are very thoughtful and provoking tonight. One of the most amazing was you talked about the weapons of love, peace, and mercy. (laughs) The vitriol, Jim, in my family, uh, at work, you know, in the community, you don't understand the vitriol. And you're telling me that love peace and mercy can be a weapon? (laughs) Absolutely. Um, You know, it's just like the Lord to show up with a different way, completely different from our human perspective. And I can only tell you, engaging the LGBT community, which I have done, we work together with the Gill Foundation here in Colorado. The Gill Foundation is probably the second most powerful uh, LGBT lobbying group in the country. And I called them and said, we have an opportunity to work together to strengthen sex trafficking laws in Colorado. Are you willing? I met with a gay lobbyist at the time who represented uh, the Gill Foundation. He and, I, he and I worked together and we were able to substantially increase sex trafficking laws in the state of Colorado. And in that transaction, it was so amazing because uh, I, I pitched the proposal of what we could do. And he said, you know what? Before we go any further, can I just tell you my story? I said, sure. He said, I was raised in a Christian home in a a farmhouse in Kansas. And when I got to college, I realized I I was gay. And I just came home, to be honest, to my parents. I went to church four days a week through high school. And he said, I just wanted to be honest with my parents. So I told him, my dad stood up, burst into tears and said, I love you, but I never want to see you again. And that put me into tears. And I think that exchange cemented our relationship in a profound way. And over the years, we've continued to work together and talk about things. And he's a high-end attorney that helped get gay marriage passed in the the United States. And just that 
transaction in his heart and my heart and his ability to see me broken for him has led him to begin searching for the Lord once again. And he keeps telling me, I, you make me so angry because when we get together, it pushes me closer to the Father. Wow. That is my mission. I don't have to win. I just need to present a gospel that is truly compelling to any person who is thoughtful, including people that are in direct opposition to some of the Scripture. And I'm telling you, it cracks their heart open. And I think that's the way God has designed us. If we show sincerity, if we show love toward those people, it, it, it's as if it's irresistible that their heart breaks open and they want to know more. And that is a far better way than battling it out. Because when you do that, shaking a finger at someone, it only digs their heels in. When they feel care and kindness from you, it opens their heart. And then the Holy Spirit can do his work. Jim, as our time winds down together this evening, could you lead us in a closing prayer, please? Oh, love to. Thank you, Jack. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for what you have done for us. Just like Phil Robertson said, you've taken away our sins and you promise and give us everlasting life with you. Who doesn't want that? And Lord, we pray for those people that can't see clearly what you have done, that you came to this earth to save us from those sins and sacrifice yourself for us. Help us to prove that in our hearts and in our minds, that that was your mission. And Lord, the way the pieces fall together when we get that clear in our head. I pray for that clarity for this culture. Like your word says, that if we can turn from our wickedness and humble ourselves, that you will be there for us. And we pray for that very thing to happen, Lord. Help the church to be humble. Help the church to be loving and kind and gracious toward the POWs that are ensnared by the enemy of our souls. And Lord, give us that conviction to speak truth, to do it with love, to draw people unto you. And we ask you to do that in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jim Daly, thanks very much for sharing your amazing journey and ministry. Keep up the great, great work. Thank you, Jack. Appreciate it. Please join us next week. Until then, I'm Jack Krasula. Thanks for listening. Make it a great week because with God, anything is possible. Spawn. Believe in yourself.